Hello, I'm Bob Challoner, the Chief Administrative Officer at Stony Brook Southampton Hospital, and I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Focus on Stony Brook Southampton Hospital, your monthly program about the people, services, and events at your local community hospital, and thank you for tuning in today. Today we welcome a member of our medical staff, Dr. George Coolius, who is a board-certified vascular surgeon on our staff here at Southampton. And we're very lucky to have Dr. Coolius with us full-time, uh, both at the hospital and serving the community. And he's going to talk about a topic that many of us don't know a lot about, vascular disease, and the services that we offer at the, here on the East End. Um, Dr. Coolius, in addition to being one of our uh, vascular surgeons, is also the co-director of our Center for Advanced Wound Healing and is a member of the faculty at Stony Brook Medicine where he's an assistant professor in the School of Medicine. So welcome Dr. Coolius and thank you well, very thank much, you for, very much for the invitation. My pleasure. Thank you for being on the program and also all the good work that you're doing here in the community. And just as I always like to do, uh, if, if you could um, uh, start off, just tell us a little bit about yourself and your, your, your educational background. I'm always, uh, I'm always fascinated with all of the training that the medical staff goes through, but just tell people about you know, your background, and then I'd like to hear how you ended up out here on the, on the east end of Long Island. Yes, well, the, um, the background of every surgeon is usually um, several years of hard work, right. starting from medical school going to uh, general surgery, surgical education where people become um, general surgeons and then they specialize to what they think is more appropriate for their personality, their skills, right. and um, more um, conducive to the way they feel that they can serve their patients. Right. Uh, I liked um, cardiothoracic and vascular surgery. It's, um, it's, a, in a, it's a, um, a field that is considered by many physicians as very demanding. Right. At the same time, although it's extremely rewarding, and I've seen that on many occasions since I joined your staff here at uh, Southampton Hospital, almost now three years, right. uh, where we, um, we were in the position, in the pleasant position to help a lot of people that had serious circulation problems. And in any other circumstance, we would have to be airlifted or trans transferred to major institutions, and they were served um, uh, decisively in this area without having to go somewhere else. And that I know is important because so much of uh, every time we have to transport somebody there's a there's a risk involved with that both the time that it takes and also just uh, um, it's always better just to try and take care of somebody on the spot, right? Right, right. Uh, actually uh, just um, uh, saying something extra to what you just mentioned, transporting somebody uh, Besides the um, very significant financial burden that is associated with those transports, is also putting the patient at risk. Even right. transporting people with uh, the latest equipment and technology involves uh, involves somebody being monitored, vital signs, things can happen on the way. Right. It's in any way we look at it, it's better to serve our patients as close to their home as possible. And I think uh, when it comes to vascular disease. Uh, and cardiology. Um, this has been possible the last two or three years with uh, the services that we have been providing. That's right, and I know you've brought a number of innovations to our hospital and to the community, which I'm going to be uh, uh, thrilled to hear from you about and talk about. Um, but maybe if we could start off with. Um, I think people typically know surgeons. Surgeons are doing things like appendectomies <laughs> and hernia repairs and all the things that surgeons do. And vascular disease is, is a, um, an area of specialty that uh, takes uh, uh, quite a bit of extra training. It's a field that's evolved very significantly, I know, right. over the last couple of years. Um, but maybe if you could just explain to us uh, what is vascular disease? We all know we have a heart, we all know we have lungs, um, but tell us what is vascular right. disease and why the vascular system is so important. Well, I think that's the, that's the, um, that's the basic question that uh, we have to always to clarify to our patients. Um, the people um, are not physicians, right. they are not medical professionals, and they would like to know the basis of their problems so they can uh, change what they do and get better with our, with our assistance. Vascular disease is something very simple and uh, since we have arteries which bring oxygen to all parts of our body, 
Vascular disease is basically the piling up and an accumulation of cholesterol in our arteries. Okay. It's like something similar with um, clogged pipes in our homes. Uh, uh, of course, a little bit more complicated in the sense that the um, consequences can sometimes be devastating. It can, um, it can um, um, be in any part of our body. It can be in our neck, affecting the blood supply to our brain. It can be to our legs, affecting the blood supply to our legs and our ability to walk and perform functions. It can be in our heart, affecting the blood supply to our heart muscle, and then we have a heart attack. Okay. Depending on where the reduction of blood flow is can have different, um, sometimes devastating consequences. The job of the vascular surgeon is to identify where those blockages are, see which of them have to be treated, and provide good advice, in addition to treatment, provide good advice to the patient so we can stop that piling up in other parts of the body. Okay. And that is a chronic process, uh, Bob. It takes years, usually, uh, tell my patients, and sometimes they are surprised, that um, it takes two to three decades of piling up before you visit the vascular surgeon. Two to three decades, really? Yeah. Yes, 20 okay. to 30 years. And a, a lot of things, um, patient, patients today know a lot of things. So right. They are way more educated than when I was in medical school, for right. example, 20, almost 25 years ago. They know that smoking has to do with their vascular disease. They right. know that um, certain types of um, nutritional habits and dietary habits also make things worse. They know that the exercise makes things worse. So they're, they're a little bit, they know, they know a few things, but it's always good to go back to the basics and explain our, to our patients why they are in our office and what vascular disease is to um, the basic level. I always have the image of the pipe. I don't know why I, <laughs> I think about it, but I always think I about the the, the, the hot water pipe at home, and over years you get calcium buildup on the inside of the pipe, and then it gets narrower and narrower and narrower, and suddenly your water pressure goes, and you've got a blockage or something like that. Uh, it's a very I similar. I don't yes. know how accurate, but I, I know there's probably different types of vascular disease also. Are there, can you describe what types there are? Yes, are there any more, more severe or, um, um, uh, that we should worry about I, more I than I think others? that's a key aspect of vascular disease and I thank you for asking that question for, because the answer I think is, is significant to know a few things that are different on different types of vascular disease for our viewers. Uh, the, depending on where the arteries go, uh, as we said before, the, um, clogging of those arteries can be devastating. If you lose, for example, blood supply to your brain, I think our viewers will probably have know that some, that is serious. Right. They can have strokes, they can have um, cognitive impairment, they can have visual impairment. Um, and usually, uh, a vascular disease that is directed to arteries uh, for serious organs have more serious consequences. I would mention our kidneys. Right. Uh, when we have vascular disease to our kidneys, we get kidney failure and we may end up uh, on hemodialysis. Okay. Uh, if we have vascular disease uh, of the arteries of the heart itself, then we get a heart attack and we may need to do stents in the heart or bypass surgery. And again, as we said before, and the carotid arteries, which are the arteries that feed our brain, having serious blockages there may cause uh, strokes. Okay. Uh, the other significant aspect that people don't associate with vascular disease, Bob, is the venous disease. And that is something that is, uh, I would just say... Just remind everyone we have the arteries and the veins and right, which ones right. do what. The arteries are the pipes that bring oxygen to our target organs, our okay. feet, our legs, our upper extremities, our head, so they can feed them with oxygen and nutrients. Right. And the veins are the, um, I would say, conduits okay. that bring the blood after it has given all its nutrients and its oxygen back to the lungs okay. so it can get reoxygenated with our breathing. Okay. So the veins are more conduits that bring back the blood that has already, to, a, to uh, I would say, greatest degree, um, completed its mission. But because they are so numerous in our body and it's a huge and highly organized collective si collecting system, they, um, uh, they can have serious diseases that have to do uh, not with the usual 
exercise, smoking, and cholesterol factors, but they are more uh, hereditary. Okay. And uh, a lot of them are out of our preventive reach. Okay. There is nothing we can do to prevent venous disease. The other thing that is interesting about the veins and our venous disease is that the incidence of venous disease is several times higher Venous disease is so interesting. Right, yeah, okay. than arterial disease. Right. I would say that probably 70%, 70 percent, seven zero, of U.S. population have some type of venous disease. Okay. Uh, it's usually not so detrimental as arterial disease, but it's something that causes symptoms, and especially people that spend a lot of time daily on their legs, on their feet. They have, uh, they do manual labor. They work in banks. They have to stay in shops and uh, supermarkets, they have to stay up on their feet. Those people at the end of the day can have, um, uh, they can suffer. They okay. can have complaints in their legs, fatigue, and a lot of other things that uh, we see uh, are getting more and more frequent. Okay. And that have to do with venous insufficiency, meaning malfunction of the venous system of the legs. Okay. So, so these are the basically two types of vascular disease, the arterial and the venous. In venous, you know, the arterial blockages um, that happen in the venous disease, is it, is it a blockage also or is it some other thing that's going well, that on? Is, um, uh, that, is, that is a key question. The, the, art, the venous insufficiency is not related to blockage. Okay. Um, I want to just say and uh, mention uh, for our viewers an interesting uh, factoid is that the capacity, meaning how much blood uh, the venous system can um, absorb is nine times more than the arterial system. We okay. have more, nine times more veins than arteries in our body, and 80% uh, of them are closed, okay. meaning they are non-functional, but they are on a reserve mode. And everyone 80% are closed, ev really? Everybody, or yes. Even younger people? Even younger people, yes. Uh, okay. And they can get um, activated uh, if we get more active. Okay. So there is a huge um, number of veins that are not used daily by us, the ones that are used, when they get diseased, they don't get diseased with the arterial mechanism, okay. which is clogging, atherosclerosis, piling up of cholesterol. Right. What happens to those veins is that they get big, they get dilated, okay. and because veins have to bring blood from the extremities to the chest, which is against gravity right. on an upright person, they usually get bigger and they dilate because of gravity and because of insufficiency of some one-way valves that exist in the veins. Okay. That is a major reason that people get clots because we have venostasis, meaning blood does not go to the heart but stays a little bit longer to the extremities, or they have varicose veins and a series of other venous issues that uh, some of them are visible and people come to us because they see something new in their extremities. Right. Sometimes and is that that swelling that some right, people or get? Or some or of them have swelling, right. ankle swelling, extremity swelling, fatigue, or uh, I hear from a lot of my patients, they say that um, they have what the books say, costalgia, which is a search of a, a sense of burning okay. at the end of their working day. Okay. That gets um, relieved when we elevate the legs. Okay. That is usually a sign of venous disease. Okay. So that's blood essentially is pooling down in the lower right. extremities, right. elevate it. And that's, that's precisely what it is. Blood goes to the heart eventually. Right. It just spends longer time than it should in the extremity. Okay. Imagine that blood, the circulation is a dynamic process. Right. With every heartbeat, a certain amount of blood reaches our extremities. If that amount of blood does not exit our extremities, right. but stays there longer, you can imagine that we have this uh, con what we call congestion, which is um, the presence of a larger volume of blood per minute in our legs. Okay. And that's what causes our symptoms to our patients, especially the ones that, um, that uh, stay up in the, up, up the upright position during the day. Okay. People that work manually, people that work uh, in, um, usually in, um, in, the, in, the, uh, in supermarkets, in schools, teachers, a lot of teachers. Okay. Uh, complain of those uh, extremity complaints. And again, as in the arterial um, section, it takes one to two decades of quote-unquote congestion to start developing symptoms okay. and start seeing things in our extremities. 
So let's talk about symptoms, but before we do that, it's always, we always talk about risk factors in healthcare, and you've mentioned a few already. I mean, uh, some of them are the, the clear lifestyle issues like right. smoking, lack of exercise, what, and it sounds like standing is potentially one for, right. uh, what about, are there other, um, other risk factors? I, I'm for, afraid I will become repetitive because right. I'm sure many of your other physician guests right. go over those factors because the same factors affect them, a variety of symptoms in different parts of the body. When right. it comes to the arterial and the venous disease, uh, it's our nutrition, right. it's our exercise level, is what we eat. I'm sure some other of your guests have some, went over those things uh, right. um, in the past. Um, uh, is the avoidance of what we call animal fat. That is something that uh, uh, every scientific research that comes out today points that we should be reducing then the amount of animal fat that we consume okay. we consume that definitely has a correlation with the rate that our arteries are clogging up okay. the less you eat of that fat the longer it takes for your arteries to get diseased okay uh, there are some genetic factors that um, nobody can control. Right. I think that the some people are just their family history. There's right, more right. Some of them have been identified. Some right. people have a higher tendency to produce cholesterol, okay. despite the perfect diet. But this is two percent of the people that have a problem. Okay, ninety-eight percent of our patients can make uh, serious modifications and affect the course of the vascular disease significantly. Okay, another very significant factor. Again, many times out of control, but sometimes also uh, within control of our patients is diabetes. Right. Diabetes is something that um, affect vascu affects vascular disease because the presence of diabetes accelerates the clogging up of the arteries. Really? What is it about the diabetes? Is uh, diabetes is something that, uh, of course, everybody of our viewers know it's high blood sugar. Right. Um, it, starts, um, it starts the process of piling up of that cholesterol plaque. Right. Uh, at lower vessels. Okay. Uh, imagine that, um, and I'll go back to your example about the, uh, the pipes at home, which I think is something that uh, a lot of our patients identify with those analogies. If the pipe is uh, small, it, it, we can imagine that that pipe can probably clog up earlier than a nearby pipe that is three or four times in diameter. Well, diabetes targets those small pipes in the body. Okay. Has a, um, predilection for um, disease of the small arteries. Okay. So arteries that are uh, one tenth of an inch or less are affected. Okay. And these are the arteries that the vascular surgeon cannot treat. Cannot. Cannot. Okay. They're out of our treatment range okay. with the present technology. If it is less than one eighth of an inch, okay. two millimeters and less, and certainly less than one millimeter, right. It's out of the range of treatment for vascular surgery. And where are these small arteries? Are these the ones that the are small, way out into the fingers exactly. and toes? Are and at the yeah. are at the periphery of our body. Okay. Toes, fingers, right. and also what we call terminal vessels in uh, some parts of the body. Okay. I'm sure you have noticed that some diabetic patients usually have a higher incidence of amputation of right. toes, because that's where the circulation is terminal and it doesn't have additional circulation. If we lose those toe arteries, we cannot recreate them. Interesting. So that's and, good uh, to know because sometimes we assume medicine is so, can do everything, but there are certain limitations. Right, that right. there are parts of the vascular system, and I think that's an interesting topic, and I would yeah. like to spend a few seconds for our viewers. Yeah. There are some parts of the vascular system that we cannot treat. Okay. The toes, the hand to some extent, and uh, the very very small vessels in the central nervous system, right. meaning the brain, okay. uh, below a certain size that is in the vicinity of uh, one eleventh to, of an inch, I would say 1.7 to 1.8 millimeters, below that size, meaning smaller than this size, we don't have effective technology today to treat them. Okay. So that's where we emphasize heavily on prevention and the things that you mentioned before regarding lifestyle modification, nutrition, exercise, 
smoking, huge, the numbers for smoking in our country and the majority of Western world are improving right. the last 30 That's years. That's right, we have seen a big and reduction is, in it. And yeah. that is helping tremendously. Right. Again, as the other risk factors, it takes two to three decades for those individual risk factors to produce their deleterious effects. Okay. Is that one of the reasons why the eye problems happen with diabetics? Because a little tiny mm -hmm. vascular system exactly in the That is exactly the case. Okay. Right. Eye is also a terminal, what we call terminal arterial system, okay. because imagine the vessels enter the eye and there is no adjacent or collateral blood supply. If that artery that feeds the eye has an occlusion, there is no mechanism created by nature to bring collateral flow to that eye. Okay. That's why today diabetes is the number one reason for um, um, loss of eyesight. Right. Right. Before it used to be other infectious, infectious reasons, but the last 30, 40 years, diabetes is the only reason that people can lose their eye, Interesting. practically. So let's talk a little bit about symptoms. You mentioned some already, but what are the symptoms that, you know, uh, we, I, I see these things in the, po everybody sees things on the internet. If you've got the following things, you need to be worried about X, Y, and Z. But what are some of the symptoms that, you know, you think we should be watchful for? And it sounds like particularly as we get older, because as the years right. you know, I accumulate. I would say after the fifth decade of life, okay. we should be vigilant. Um, about symptoms for vascular disease. Okay. I will not go into great detail, but I would like to alert our viewers to a few categories of symptoms that merit immediate attention. Um, I would say that anything that has to do with an abrupt change in the nervous system merits uh, immediate attention and a visit to the emergency room regardless of the time of the day. Okay. If we have any speech changes that are immediate, if we have any loss of function of any of the extremities, okay. if we cannot suddenly speak or find the right words, and that is something acute, meaning was not existing a few minutes ago, especially if it's something witnessed by bystanders, right. that, unless otherwise uh, specified, is uh, a possible stroke. Right. That could be a sign of vascular disease of the arteries that goes up, that go up in the neck, okay. the carotid arteries or the vertebral arteries. Any of those symptoms that are acute, who are not pre-existing, and uh, deserve an immediate 911 call. Okay. Uh, I would say and we that we can't emphasize that enough, right? People we sometimes cannot. say, "Oh, I'll see if it'll pass." It, it, it's, be anything it's better that has, to be safe than anything sorry. that has to do exactly right. anything that has to do with with sensory function of the extremities, meaning okay. we don't feel something with our fingers. Okay. Any of the extremities don't, not moving good as the other extremity. Any speech impediment that is acute, meaning sudden. Right. Any difficulty in, um, that has to do with um, finding of the right word. And of course, uh, any acute symptoms that have to do with our head as you know, a tremendous headache, or um, people see, um, have severe sudden vision changes. Right. The majority of our patients describe a big black curtain that comes from the top to the bottom okay. and eliminates their visual field. Right. These are all symptoms that you cannot wait to get better. Then okay. you have to call 911. And, uh, and uh, our EMS system is geared into um, bringing those people immediately to the emergency room. Right. This has to do with the head. The, the heart attack symptoms, that is another vascular disease, but in another territory, in right. the heart territory, are well known to, I think, everybody of our viewers. They have to do with sudden, significant chest pain. Right. That is the cardinal symptom. We can uh, see some different uh, manifestations of that symptom based on uh, diabetics versus not diabetics, uh, males versus females, but is usually some type of pain that, ha that is more pressure and less pain. It's behind our breastbone, our, our sternum, and usually radiates to the ankle of the jaw and the left arm. Okay. This is the 90 plus percent presentation of uh, people that have um, ischemia of the heart. Okay. 
When it comes to vascular disease of the extremities, and I would say mainly in the legs, uh, the legs have 93% of the vascular disease and the rest of 7% is on the upper extremities. Okay. Uh, have to do with uh, similar symptoms, but of course more tailored into the lower extremities. Uh, people cannot walk anymore as they used to because they cannot go from the parking lot of the supermarket to the supermarket to do their shopping. In the middle of the parking lot, their calf hurts. Okay. Uh, the calf hurt, the, um, the thighs sometimes hurt if the disease is more severe. And sometimes people have pain even without walking. Even watching TV or uh, talking to somebody, they start having extremity pain. Okay. That is highly abnormal and again deserves a trip in the emergency room if the pain is at what we call at rest. Okay. Pain with walking is not, it's not necessarily something that you need to go immediately, but I would definitely call my primary care physician or the vascular surgeon and get in to get checked if this is something new. Okay. A lot of these people, I have to say from our experience, uh, have these symptoms for the extremities, I'm not talking about the, the head, uh, have these symptoms for years and they have been watching them getting worse because the more we don't treat those symptoms, the more the patient to feel better reduces the level of his activity. All right. Okay. They, in other words, they walk less uh, just because they don't want to experience the pain. By walking less, we further reduce our circulation. We accelerate the clogging process. Okay. And then we still can't walk, walk anymore. Okay. So by not walking, we accelerate the entire process of clogging up our, of our arteries. We're making it worse. Walk, not walking is, um, is the absolute best way to make our vascular disease worse. Oh, interesting. So one of the things I'm confused though, there's some, it sounds like some disease where people who are on their feet a lot end up with more problems, but yet walking is good. So how do we... How do right, we right, right. I, let, me, let me make this distinction a little bit to yeah. this very, uh, uh, very astute observation. Walking uh, versus standing up are two different things for the vascular system. Okay. And also, uh, the type of walking is two, there are two different things on the vascular system. Walking, what we call, um, uh, you know, shopping mall walking, does not make the vascular system any better. Right. Or walking our pet does not usually make our vascular system better. Uh, walking with frequent breaks, every six, seven feet for a pet, or watching, seeing something else in the mall, doesn't really train our vascular system to increase its circulation. Okay. Walking for the vascular system means medium to high pace walking that is uninterrupted. Okay. For how for, long would you For at it? least, uh, depends on the patient's capability, but it has to do for at least six to eight minutes at a time. Okay. Uh, in multiple sessions. All right. There are more scientific ways to, um, to determine how much me versus somebody else should walk. Uh, but this is, I think, out of the scope of our, our, um, our meeting today. The number one message is that we need uninterrupted walking. Right. Now, for the venous system, what we were saying before, varicose veins and, uh, and symptoms of the extremities that are not related to walking, um, prolonged standing up is not good and uh, is associated with a uh, when accel acceleration of symptoms, meaning symptoms come back um, faster. Uh, this is a different way of uh, having vascular disease. Again, I wanted to put it in our, in, reader's in our viewer's perspective is that veins are eight times more frequent to have an issue than arteries. Okay. So we see way more venous patients in our offices than the arterial patients. Are the varicose veins that people sometimes have, is that an example? That is the that majority is of our patients come in for is that enlarged a, a veins issue? Okay, that have yeah. been congested for ye from years of standing up okay. and now are painful okay. and um, cause a lot of uh, burning and, um, and uh, pain in the, on the patient. We have many very effective ways Right. And we have a large series of venous, of venous disease patients that have been treated in our hospital the last two years okay. uh, with, high, uh, with a very high degree of success 
and a very high patient satisfaction rate. Okay. Technology has given those people the last six or seven years multiple options to cure their venous disease on an outpatient basis or even with very small trips to the hospital with two or three hour hospital stay okay. and then they go home. And then, okay. Yes, and a lot of our patients now choose this way of getting treated. Uh, they come in, they receive their treatment that is tailored to their problem and then two or three hours later, their designated driver brings them back home where they recover essentially over an extended weekend. When, uh, when would you say a um, varicose vein is something that somebody really, a lot of people get varicose veins, is it something that immediately somebody should go get help on or is it something? No, right. I think that is something that is not urgent right. as it is in the arterial circulation. Okay. But it's something that um, if we see them getting bigger right. or when they form clusters, meaning we had one varicose vein and then now we see seven okay. or eight varicose veins that are congregating in a specific area of the extremity, usually it's in the calves, right. uh, then I think we should uh, visit our physician. You don't have to treat them immediately, but you have to know what it means to treat them versus not to treat them. There are many conservative ways of treating those veins, those varicose veins that are not offering long-term solutions. Right. But, and the number one way of treating them, those non-surgically, I would say, is uh, the application of compression stockings. Okay. Which is something that makes the patient feel immediately better. Right. And uh, some people say that also uh, stops the progression of the disease. Um, I, uh, I recommend compression patients to 100% of my venous patients. You do? Okay. Yes, to everybody. And why is that? Because that's pushing the blood supply exactly. back that, up? Exactly. Okay. That's squeezing the pipe in some Perfect. Ways. Because with every step, our muscles um, squeeze blood to go up. Right. And uh, so we have an internal pressure for our from our muscles that are working while we're walking. Right. And an external from the stocking. Okay. Uh, we use the appropriate pressure stockings uh, based on the patient's anatomy and what the nature of his issue is and everybody feels better. But this is not a cure of the problem. This is a cure of their symptoms. Right. The problem persists. And as I said, we have um, great ways the last decade to fix those compared to before. Before we needed to have, you know, basically, um, basically everybody had to go to the operating room. Right. Now that is not the case anymore. There's other techniques. Yeah. So we're gonna be out of time <coughs> soon, unfortunately, but um, I know you're also the um, co-director of our wound care program. Can you just talk to me about how does how does how do wounds and wound care tie into uh, the work of a vascular right. surgeon? It is it is uh, it is really uh, it is really a continuum of vascular disease, and the majority of the wounds have to do with um, either uh, less oxygen than uh, the optimal levels of oxygen that we should have at our extremities or uh, are associated with, diabe with diabetes. Right. Uh, so being a vascular surgeon, we see all the time wounds, people with wounds at the office. And our participation for, on those patients, on helping those patients, is to make sure that they have enough oxygen so their body can heal those wounds. Okay. Uh, in the process, uh, I have to say that I'm extremely pleased. I discovered that uh, uh, already in our hospital here, we had an integrated service that was treating those patients for years. Right. And I, um, I decided to participate, the team of great physicians and nurses at the wound care center. And uh, since then, I think we have made great, um, great progress in making people know that every wound um, deserves a wound care center. Uh, so we can have faster healing. So vascular surgery, circulation, and uh, wound healing are really uh, interconnected. All right, excellent. And I know that you yourself are involved <coughs> in a number of things here. Uh, we do community screenings, you do um, vascular right. screening a number of times a year, um, and also in the wound care, you're not utilizing a number of innovative treatments of wounds, new, right. uh, new substances and materials and approaches. There so. has been a revolution the last half, I would say less than seven or eight years in the way the majority of lower extremity wounds are treated. Right. 
Uh, at this point, uh, we use top technology and uh, new dressings that have been proven to um, speed up the healing of the wound. I just wanted for our viewers to give an e interesting factoid that um, 10 years ago, a patient that had a wound in the extremity uh, that had to do with venous insufficiency, what we discussed before, uh, had an average healing time of 14 months. So he had to go every week for 14 months to his physician to expect the wound to heal. 14 months, wow. The average time now is... It's hard is, to get people to comply with that right. length of a treatment. Winter, snow, people right. cannot make it to the wound care center, cannot right. make it to their physician. Uh, co-pays, resources. Right. Uh, so the healing rate of venous ulcers 10 years ago was only 40%. Wow. The other 60% of people could not make that long-term commitment to heal their wounds. Mm -hmm. Today, the healing time of venous ulcers, instead of 14 months, is four months. Four months, wow. And that has decreased because of new materials. Wow. And the treatment of venous disease that we discussed before. Right. Now, venous ulcers, together with appropriate wound care, um, have led to more compliance. If people know that they will probably heal in three or four months, they make an effort to be there versus being more pessimistic uh, if they knew that it will have, they will have to go for one and a half year to the doctor every right. week. Right. So that I think is a significant advance. Uh, again, showing how circulation, vascular medicine, vascular surgery, and wound care uh, interconnect. And where do people go to get more information about this, um, these programs? I think our hostel's website has significant okay. information, especially the new website after our merge with uh, Stony Brook. Right. Uh, I think it's a more interactive website. Right. Um, you can immediately see things that have to do with um, cardiology, with vascular surgery, with wound care, and we can also see uh, information about um, wound, uh, sorry, wound care and vascular screenings. There are also there, uh, usually a few phone numbers that you can call and get more information if you're interested for something specific, right. like um, vein screening or an arterial screening. Uh, also, the Department of Vascular Surgery at Stony Brook, which is something very accessible over the internet, provides immediate information. All our administrative assistants are very happy to inform anybody where they can reach us for um, a, a little bit more targeted information. Wonderful. I know we'll be doing future screenings and ask people right. to stay tuned and look for those as well. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. And Dr. Coolius, uh, for all the innovations you've brought here, the great work you're doing in the community and with our patients, I just want to say thank you to you and your team, actually. We have you're a welcome. Team thank up. you for your invitation and uh, thank our viewers for their, for their attention to these uh, issues. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, and I would like to thank all of you for watching us today. Um, as always, I'd like to thank our friends at CTV for producing and airing this show in our Southampton communities and our friends at LTV for airing the program in our East Hampton communities. If you have any questions about vascular or any of the things we've talked about, I would like to make an appointment to see Dr. Coolius in Southampton, Hampton Bays, or in Center Reach. You can call his office at 631-638-1670. We have a number of terrific vascular surgeons on staff. Um, we'd be happy to, uh, uh, to get you in touch with them as well if Dr. Coolius isn't available. Our wound care information is online. Um, and as always, if you need any help navigating the healthcare system here on the East End, please feel free to call my office at 631-726 8555. Thank you everyone for watching and good health.